What's going on, people? It's Mr. Blood Clot here again. And I'm back again with another part of uh, Ole Anderson's Inside Out, How Corporate America Destroyed Professional Wrestling by Ole Anderson with Scott Teal. We last left off, it was chapter two. So I think tonight we're going to do chapters three and four. And one small thing um, before I get started, uh, I'm going to be taking probably like a sip of water or tea here and there. I mean, it's really cold out here and I was in an office all day with heaters and stuff, so my voice is a little bit dry. So let's get this started, okay? Chapter three, I'll take the little guy. The fact that I was offered an opportunity to get into professional wrestling was more by chance than anything. After returning from a tour of Europe in the early part of 1967, I was assigned to 5th Army Headquarters in Chicago. While working out at the Irving Park YMCA in Chicago, I met a man named Tiger Malloy. Malloy was a part-time wannabe wrestler who wrestled around Chicago and had been on television with the old Fred Kohler promotion. By that time I weighed around 265 pounds and I was very strong. Malloy suggested I consider making a career in professional wrestling. When I showed an interest, he persuaded me to attend a wrestling show at Chicago's International Amphitheater. If I had heard anything about professional wrestling while I was in high school or college, I don't remember it. Of course, I couldn't have told you anything about tennis, golf, or the U.S. swimming team either because I didn't follow those sports. I wrestled when I was in high school and college. I also wrestled and played a little football during my time in the service, but I never paid any attention to pro wrestling. I had attended one show two years before, but I didn't pay much attention to the matches. As such, I didn't have any substantive knowledge about professional wrestling at the time. At that time, Vern Gagne was the promoter in the Midwest. He promoted Omaha, Nebraska, Chicago, Illinois, Winnipeg, Canada, and everything in between with his base in Minneapolis, Minnesota. In his younger days, Vern Gagne was an exceptional athlete. As an amateur wrestler, he won the Big Ten title three years in a row and was an alternate on the 1948 Olympic wrestling team. He won the NCAA title twice, the first time in 1948 in the 191-pound class and then in 1949 as a heavyweight. Vern also was an All-American football player at the University of Minnesota and was offered a contract with the Green Bay Packers. Instead of accepting the position, he chose to pursue professional wrestling. It was a good choice because he became very successful at wrestling and a promoter in the Midwest. A few years ago, I went to the NCAA tournament which was held at the Target Center Arena in Minnesota. I think it was 1996. At the end of the night, before the finals were held to determine the NCAA championships in each weight division, they introduced wrestlers from the past who were NCAA champions. 18 to 20,000 people witnessed the parade of former champions. As each champion was announced, there was a polite applause. In some cases, there was very little applause because the people weren't sure who the person being introduced was. Even the diehard amateur wrestling fans weren't sure who they were. Finally, toward the very end of the introductions, it was announced former NCAA champion heavyweight Vern Gagne. The arena erupted in applause. The noise was deafening. <clears throat> I can honestly say I was choked up. In fact, I'm choked up as I write this. I can still see it. Vern came out with one arm held in the air, waving his hand. The ovation from the crowd was tremendous. The people really showed their love and respect for Vern. I felt just like the crowd. Vern was a man I loved and respected too. I didn't know Vern personally in 1967, but I had met him when I was a sophomore in high school. At the request of my high school wrestling coach, who went to college with Vern at the University of Minnesota, Vern had visited our high school twice, the first time when I was a sophomore and again when I was a senior. <clears throat> I still have a picture of the team that was taken when I was in the 10th grade. I look like a real geek in the photo. I'm standing there like a dork watching while Vern demonstrates a chicken wing face lock on one of my teammates. Vern was probably 32 years old at the time. My coach also had pictures of NCAA wrestling champions on the wrestling board, so I saw pictures of Danny Hodge and Dale Lewis, both of whom had also became pros. 
That was only that was one of only two encounters I had with anyone connected with professional wrestling until 1967. I had watched it on TV once or twice, but hadn't developed any real interest in it. The first person Malloy introduced me to at the amphitheater was Bob Luce, the wrestling promoter in Chicago, Illinois. Right after that, he introduced me to one of Bob Luce's friends, Dick Affliss, better known as Dick the Bruiser. Of course, Dick just acted like Dick always did. Damn it, kid, get your ass down to Indianapolis, Indianapolis and I'll make you a star, blah, blah, blah. Of course, Vern Gagne was also there. He took a more subtle approach. Where are you from, he asked. Just outside of St. Paul, I replied. Surprisingly, he didn't remember me from my high school days. Hard to believe. Stop by and see me at the Dykeman Hotel in Minneapolis, he suggested. The Dickman Hotel was the site of Vern's wrestling office. Since my coach knew Vern, I decided to take Vern up on his offer. It just made more sense for me to go talk with Vern than it did to go see Bruiser because Vern was based in Minneapolis. I lived right next door in St. Paul while Bruiser's promotion was based in Indianapolis almost 600 miles away. When I walked into the office at the Dykeman, Wally Carbo and Bill Cusisto were there. Wally was a partner with Vern Gagne in the promotion while Cusisto was a former wrestler who helped them run the office. I was home on leave for 30 days so they scheduled a time for me to wrestle one of the pros so I could show them what I could do. Vern told me to show up in my sweatsuit. This was in the second half of May and it was hot as hell. Minnesota is either hot or cold. There's nothing in between. At that time I weighed somewhere around 265 and I wasn't in the greatest shape. As instructed, I showed up at the WTCN TV Channel 11, dressed in a sweatshirt, sweatpants, sweat socks, and tennis shoes. Channel 11 was in the old Calhoun Beach Hotel in Minneapolis, right off Lake Calhoun, which is where they taped the wrestling matches on Saturday. There were several wrestlers there when I walked in the door, but Vern was the one who started the tryout. Vern had me do all sorts of things. He began... He began by having me run back and forth in the ring, rebounding off the ropes. Of course I had never done that before, but when you do it for the first time, it's really difficult. It's tough to just run in the ring, but hitting the ropes is really a trick. It looks easy, but it isn't. I did everything Vern asked. He finally asked, can you do push-ups? Sure, I did push-ups, I did squats. He worked my butt off and I was sweating like a pig. Vern then asked me, are you tired yet? I didn't hesitate. Hell no. I was smart enough to know that you never admit there's anything wrong. Even if there was, you don't admit it. I learned that lesson as an amateur wrestler. You never let anyone know that you were tired. You just kept on going until you drop. Ego can make you do a lot of things that you don't think you're capable of. I was just ab- about to give out. Just when I thought I couldn't force out one more push-up, Reggie Lazowski walked in. I didn't know much about pro wrestling, but even I had heard of Reggie Lazowski. Better known as the Crusher. He was an absolute legend in the Midwest. When I heard Crusher say, Hey, look at that guy's arms. I forced out at least 20 more push-ups. Vern stepped up the pace and had me do more push-ups, sit-ups, squats, running, and this and that. I don't know how long he kept me going, but I felt like I was going to die. Vern repeated his question. Are you tired yet? Hell no. So we just kept going. When he finally called an end to it, I was hardly able to do anything. Now there are two versions to the next part of the story. Vern tells the story one way, I tell it the right way. That way it was, that way it was is that Vern said, okay, let's see if you can wrestle and he put someone in the ring to wrestle me. Vern's version of the story goes like this. After I finished doing all the push-ups, chin-ups, squats and running, he asked me if I wanted to wrestle. He says that when he, took, he told me to look around and pick someone out, I said, I'll take the little guy over there. <clears throat> I didn't know who most of the wrestlers were, <clears throat> excuse me, but I knew that little guy. Danny Hodge was a three-time national wrestling champion. As an amateur in both high school and college, I had seen his picture many times. Danny Hodge was a, a legend in wrestling, both amateur and professional. During his professional wrestling career, not only was he unbeaten during three years of wrestling at the University of Omaha, he was never even taken down. In fact, the only match he lost during that time was in the 1956 Olympics. 
Danny was wrestling the Bulgarian champion and leading in points 8-1. to one. A controversial pin was called against him and he had to settle for a silver medal. Danny had also made a name for himself in both amateur boxing, winning the Golden Gloves Championship in 1959, and professional boxing. Yes, I knew who Danny Hodge was. I never would have looked over at Danny Hodge and said, let me have the little guy. Never. Vern's version is a better story to tell than mine, though, because it makes uh, the story a little funnier. <clears throat> Danny Hodge just loved to get in the ring and mix it up. He would wrestle anybody. He looked at me like the big heavy set mark that I was. We got on the mat and I took the down position. Before I could even think about doing anything, Danny clamped down on me. I thought I was caught in a vice. Danny proceeded to run my face all over the mat until the skin was burnt off my nose, chin and forehead, not to mention my knees and elbows. In the process, he broke my nose and cracked two of my ribs. Later on, while I was getting ready to go to the hospital, Johnny Valentine told me I was lucky to get off as easy as I did. He said, if Danny had wanted to, he could have hurt you. I thought to myself, he could have hurt me, what do you call this? If it was true though, Danny Hodge could have done a whole lot worse. Years later when I got to know Danny, I realized he had taken it easy on me. Several months later, Danny told me, I didn't get too rough with you for two reasons. You didn't give up and you didn't squeal. Every time I see Danny now, he hugs me. He hugs everybody nowadays because everybody seems to be doing that crap. After Danny finished with me, Vern had tried, had me try another wrestler, Dale Lewis. Like Danny, Dale also wrestled for the University of Oklahoma. He was a two-time national champion, winning the title in 1960 and 1961. He represented the U.S. on the Greco-Roman wrestling team in the 1956 and 1960 Olympics. Dale was good, but he wasn't Danny Hodge. Dale was a genuinely nice guy. So was Danny, but Danny would hurt you. Vern and the rest of his crew didn't actually say it out loud, but I got the impression that they were all thinking they would never see me again. I went to the hospital, even though there wasn't much of anything they could do for my broken ribs and broken nose. When my friends heard that I was going back, going to work out at Channel 11, they would say things like, Your dad says you're going to go talk to Vern Gagne. I think pro wrestling is pretty much a show. You have to understand that I didn't know about anything at this point. I still thought wrestling was competitive. When I went to the TV station, as far as I knew, it was a shoot, a real competition. Of course, the first person I tangled with was Danny Hodge, so why would I go away thinking anything else? Since the second person I wrestled was Dale Lewis, I still thought it was a shoot. And then you had Vern Gagne, someone I considered to be totally legit. Where was I supposed to get the idea that it was fake from a group of people? As far as my family was concerned, they were all struck by the fact that I came home from the workout with tape on my nose and several bruises. I remember them saying, geez, I thought professional wrestling was all fake. Later on, however, when some people tried to convince me that wrestling was all fake, my offhand remark was, yeah, it may be, but no one told Hodge or Lewis. I wasn't saying that to protect the integrity of the wrestling business. I still believed it. Chapter 4. The Shooters When my 30-day 30 30 leave was up, I had to return to Chicago to finalize my discharge from the service. With that done, I returned to Minneapolis. I worked out for five or six weeks and then went back to the Calhoun Beach Hotel on a Saturday. During the time, I knew they would be wrestling. When I walked into the station, it was early, so only a couple of wrestlers were there. Vern was sitting on the edge of the ring. He had his glasses on, like always, and was working on the book. He looked up and down, and looked again, and focused in. He seemed genuinely surprised to see me. Well, you're back! When I left the TV station after, Danny, after wrestling Danny Hodge and Dale Lewis, they thought that was it. Goodbye. They didn't give a damn. I was just another guy they beat up and got rid of. Again, we don't remember. We both remember it a little bit differently, but this is my book, so Vern doesn't have any say about it. The thing that endured me to Vern, I think, was when I walked up to him and said something to the effect of, Maybe I can't beat Danny Hodge or Dale Lewis, but there's somebody in here that I can beat. Let's find out who it is. I was exactly the kind of guy Vern was looking for. 
somebody who could take a beating and still come back for more. In 1967, Vern only brought one person into the business, me. Vern had talked with two guys from the Minnesota Vikings football team, Lance Renzel, a wide receiver, and Ed White, a big guard who later won a major arm wrestling championship. In my eyes, White really wasn't that big because I was bigger than both of them. Renzel was a little guy, while White may have been 250 pounds. They were both supposed to work out and train along with me, but for whatever reason, neither of them showed up. More than likely, they got the word that somebody was waiting down there to kick their butts. Danny Hodge would have loved to have the opportunity. There were two places to train in Minneapolis, the downtown gym and a farm on the west side of town that Vern owned. I went to the farm to train with Eddie Sharkey. Eddie was a good-looking kid who was an, who was an underneath preliminary wrestler around the Twin, Cities, Twin City areas. Eddie trained wannabe wrestlers on the farm. The first thing Eddie had me do was run, and then he had me run some more. After that, we worked out and wrestled with guys like Harley Race, Rene Goulet, and Mark Starr, who Vern brought in to put me through the mill. They picked right back up where Hodge and Lewis left off with that first workout. They beat the hell out of me. Then we began wrestling. The pros call it chain wrestling, which is what we did in both high school and college. You just go through the moves, go through the moves, go through the moves. That's all. Nobody in high school called that fake. And the pros in Minneapolis weren't calling it fake. They didn't call it working either. They just called it going through the moves. My training was actually a hybrid of wrestling and working. For example, we would do a lot of amateur wrestling and then someone would demonstrate a headlock. The headlock is a hold that people just accepted at face value. Most people don't ever think about the fact that if you put a headlock on me, all I have to do is pick you up and drop you backwards onto your head. Nobody thinks in those terms. When those old timers were putting a headlock on me, I never thought about that. When they bring you along slowly like they did, and when it's never ever assumed that there's anything but legitimacy to what you're doing, that idea doesn't cross your mind. It's like taking a broad out and working until you eventually get her clothes off. She doesn't even realize what happened. How did I get here? I don't know, but now that we're here, maybe that's not the best example, but those old guys would fool you like that. You're being led down a path and you don't question it. One of the things they did that first day was to body slam me over and over and over. Your opponent crotches you, picks you up, turns you end for end and slams you on the mat. It's amazing how most people just accept things. I don't. When I mentioned how easy it would be for someone to counter the body slam, they explained it by saying, we realize that, but for now, just go with the slam. Eventually somebody will pick you up and we want you to know what to do when that happens. At that moment, our goal isn't to teach you how to prevent the slam. We want to show you in the event that you get caught in the slam position, how to protect yourself when you're being slammed. The secret is very simple. Land as flat as you can with as many body parts hitting the mat as you can. Don't have your legs sticking out because you'll hit your heels instead of the flat of your feet. You want to have the flat of your feet hit the mat. In a roundabout way, they were trying to explain how to work, but without coming right out and saying it. Even though you're not so completely stupid, you still don't really pick up on the idea. You just accept it. Yeah, well, I guess that makes sense. I suppose that if I do get caught in that position, I'd want to know how to hit the mat without killing myself. But knowing how to take the slam isn't painless. It still hurts. Eventually, we got to the holds I used years later when I was wrestling the marks a derogatory term for someone who believes pro wrestling to be real. They were a variation of the holds we used in high school, with a little modification added that turned them into devastating, torturous holds. For a person to really comprehend the damage of those holds are capable of doing, you have to give them a hands-on demonstration. What would you do if I put you in a, f a front face lock? If I applied it correctly, you'd be just miserable and then you'd puke. I don't care what an amateur background you have, that hold is something you dream about in your worst nightmare. Another example is a double wrist lock. Before I ever got into the business, when I was in Chicago with the army, a wrestler named by the name of Ralph Bartleman and I worked out at one of the public gymnasiums. One day while Ralph and I were rolling around the mat, two old guys walked up and stood in the doorway. They stood there for a long time watching us. I later learned that those two men were Ruffy Silverstein and Lou Talibur, had both been professional wrestlers way back in the dark ages. 
In fact, Silverstein also was a perf uh, former NCAA champion, having won the 1935 championship in the 175 pound class. When Ralph and I finished our workout, they hinted around that they would like to get on the mat with me. I just blew it off. At this point, they were probably 70 years old and weighed around 180 pounds. I was already up around 265 and close to 40 years younger. All I knew was that I wasn't going to assist two old farts on their way back to a heart attack. Finally, after several weeks of watching us, Lou Talibur persuaded me to roll around on the mat with him. He said, listen, I'll give you an advantage and I'll let you start on top. I'll get on the mat in the down position. I said, uh, okay, what the hell? I joked with Ralph about it. I'll give the old man a thrill and throw him around for a little bit. Talibur dropped down on all fours and I dropped to my knees beside him. The thoughts I had in my mind that day are something I'll never forget. I was thinking about kicking him. I was thinking about punching him. I was thinking about all kinds of ways I could punish this old man. I remember thinking, he's just a little guy. Not only that, but he's an old guy. He can't do anything. I'll kill him. We began the match and I broke him down to the mat without too much trouble. He began breathing heavily right away. I got cocky and thought, I'll just fart around with him for a few minutes. Unfortunately, I didn't pay much attention to what he was doing. That's when he slid out from under me, grabbed a hold of me with that double wrist lock. The next thing I knew, my face was being shoved into the mat. I had 180 pounds hanging from the end of my arm. Even as strong as I was, that was tough to counteract. The point being, it took me all of five seconds to suddenly realize that some of those old wrestlers knew things that I didn't know. I wrestled another one of those old timers after I had been in the business for a month or two. When Harley Race and I walked into the YMCA in Duluth, Minnesota, there was an old man behind the counter handing out towels. He wanted to know if he could work out with us on the mat. Harley grinned and said, sure, you can wrestle this guy, and pointed at me. A few minutes later, the guy walked in, all decked out in his wrestling gear. By this time, the YMCA was all abuzz because the news had circulated that two professional wrestlers were in the building and the old man was going to work out with one of them. The next thing we knew, the wrestling room was filled up with people. I didn't know what to do. If I didn't beat the old man right away, I was going to look bad. And if I had to struggle to beat him, I was going to look like a real loser. Heaven forbid he, if he should give me a run for my money and beat me. How would I ever show my face for the next 50 years? In the meanest, gruffest voice I could summon up, I growled, Everybody, get the hell out of here. As soon as the room had cleared, the guy got down on all fours. I couldn't believe it. He was going to give me top position. I wasn't about to argue with him, so I got down on the mat and began riding him. I didn't punch or kick, but I really worked him over. I thought, this old guy isn't much of anything. When we finally decided to end, I thought, I guess I showed that old codger who the boss is. A few minutes later, I noticed the guy having a long conversation with Harley. I walked over and heard the guy say something about being a professional wrestler in the 1930s. Harley said, oh yeah? Well, the guy you were on the mat with is Rock Wargowski. He just got in the business a month or so ago. The guy looked over at me and he turned back to Harley and said, Yeah, I figured he was new because he seemed to be a little stiff. The entire time I, I had been busting my rear end trying to control the guy, making an effort to punishment, he had been working with me. That gave me a little more respect for some of those old codgers. Years later, in 1976, I had a discussion with the great Malenko a wrestler whose na real name was Larry Simon. As a rule, Gene Anderson, my partner, and I always traveled together, and we seldom took anyone else with us. We never wasted time talking to anybody before or after our match. When we finished our match, we went straight home. On this afternoon, however, Larry was riding with us. Gene was driving, and I was in the passenger seat. Larry, who was sitting in the back seat, began talking about Carl Gotch. Carl Gotch was known as a master of submission wrestling. His reputation as a shooter or legitimate wrestler made him feared by most of the wrestlers in the business. Unfortunately for Carl, his competence as a tough guy wrestler didn't translate into the professional world. Wrestling promoters never gave him much of a push for whatever reason, so when Larry started to talk about him, I said, fuck Carl Gotch. What do you mean, Larry asked. How tough can Carl Gotch be, I sputtered. Right now he's on a garbage truck in Hawaii, so who's Carl Gotch? Larry calmly asked, do you think you could beat Carl Gotch? 
I don't know, I said, but how tough can he be? What the hell is there to be worried about? A month or two later, we were headed to Greensville, South Carolina. When Gene pulled up, Malenko was in the front seat, which was usually my seat, but I didn't argue about it. I just opened the door and slid into the back. On the far side was a man with short hair. He was sitting at a strict attention and was staring straight ahead. I knew right away it was Carl Gotch. He was just visiting Larry. Hello, I said. Carl didn't turn his head. He turned his whole body from the waist up and said hello to me, and then slowly turned back and looked straight ahead again with his chin jutted forward. He didn't look like he had two ounces of fat on his body. He looked lean, maybe 240. He had the typical, he looked like the st stereotypical German officer preparing to gas about 600 people. Oof. <laughs> I knew what was going on. I immediately realized that Gene and Larry had, it set up, had set up a rib on me. A few weeks before that, I had been stabbed and left for dead. So I got kind of flippant and said, let me tell you something. If you want to get a piece of my ass, you'd better get a ticket and get in line. On top of that, you'd better pack a lunch. Carl turned, Carl turned to face me, but it was like he was, was in slow motion. Once again, the entire upper body turned to my direction. In a low, monotone voice, he said, When I wrestle you, I will pack a lunch because I want to take all day. When I never had to pack a lunch... He sh we shot the bull during the rest of the trip to Greenville and had a couple of beers on the way home after the show. I never saw Carl again after that night. I don't know how good Carl Gotch was in regards to the business, but I do remember s something he told me. He said, I wish I hadn't been as good as I was. At the very least, I wish I hadn't let anybody know about it. He felt like his tough guy reputation kept him from making a lot of money in the business. Whether that's true or not, I don't know. There were a lot of tough guys who thought they were the best workers in the world, who felt like they weren't given an opportunity for one reason or another. The fact of the matter is, as workers, many of them were absolutely incompetent. There's one thing I do know. I had been in wrestling for eight years at that point, and, have, and having been around some of the old shooters, I realized they could do things to people that I never thought was possible. And that's the end of the chapter. Just one quick thing, guys. Uh, I, there's a few words I'm stuttering on. Just so you know, this book is riddled with like typos and spelling mistakes and stuff. So like I'm doing my best. And um, anyways, I hope you enjoyed uh, parts. This is part three, uh, chapters three and four. And uh, thanks for watching. And everyone have a safe and happy night.